what's up and welcome back to Itgo YouTube. Today I'm so excited because I'm going to be interviewing the one and only Andy Griffiths who if you don't know who he is you're probably living under a rock but he is the author of the Treehouse series and so many other amazing amazing books and literally everyone in the whole entire world is obsessed with him and I'm so excited to interview him so let's get into it. So first off what can readers um, expect from the 130 story Treehouse book? What can they expect from it? They can expect, as usual, the unexpected. And for this one, I just thought we've done so many wild and crazy things. We've traveled in time, we've battled vegetables, um, we've, we've you know, been to the bottom of the sea, we've climbed the never ending staircase. I thought, what haven't we done? We haven't been into space to have an intergalactic adventure. And, uh, and I thought it'd be really funny. I could just see the tree being blasted through outer space, having been abducted by a giant flying eyeball. And uh, the eyeball takes me, Terry and Jill to the planet Eyeballia to make us fight in an intergalactic death battle against 12 other deadly aliens. And um, that was the beginning, that was my idea. And I just thought I, that I'd like to read that one. And, uh, and now I, I've, I've, I've lived it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the 10th book in the series. So do you think the Trias series is gonna continue to grow? Cause like the Trias is pretty tall. Uh, yeah, well, it seems to keep growing every year. That's um, been 10 years now. And the nature of the treehouse is that anything can happen. Anything is possible. So it's not hard to come up with another 13 levels for each book. And as I do, those levels suggest what might happen in the book. For instance, in this one, we have a, an intergalactic uh, obs alien observation center. So Andy and Terry are there looking at the skies right at the start. So that, you know, invites the ideas that, that come into that, that book. Um, so there's no, no end in sight, although we did start with 13 levels and we're pretty close to 13 books. So that kind of feels like it might be a, a natural place to stop building if we if we ever get sick of it and if of course our readers ever get sick of it of which we haven't got any indication yet so why does the treehouse grow by 13 stories like is it a significant number or is it just completely random it's a random number uh that happened when terry and i were working on another book uh i just said for that book can you draw me a fantasy treehouse but a really dangerous one, like the most world's most dangerous treehouse with a bowling alley where bowling balls might fall out of the tree and hit people on the head, where a tank full of man-eating sharks where people could fall in. And so everything was wrong about that tree. I gave Terry two suggestions, those ones I just told you. And then he went away and drew this beautiful 13 story treehouse. I counted them up. You've done 13 stories and there's a there's um, a catapult on top. There's a, um, a marshmallow machine. I mean, this is this is the sort of book, the sort of tree I would love to have had when I was growing up. And I said, let's forget that other idea and just write about a treehouse with 13 stories. So that is how it came to be called the 13 story treehouse. And when we finished that one and we would loved writing it and the, uh, the uh, readers loved reading it we said let's do it again and we'll just add another 13 stories that feels right um, so that becomes then the rule uh, a random accident becomes an iron rule that has to be followed so it helps, helps us make decisions too so did you have a treehouse growing up I didn't. Um, I did have uh, a pine forest down not far from where I lived and I was able to go and climb in those trees anytime. But my cousin David had a, a single level treehouse, just a platform in an old oak tree. And we, we used to love playing there. 
you know, the truth is you don't really need 130 stories of madness in a tree. You just need one and an imagination. And that's what my working life is like when I get together with Terry and I live with Jill. She's you know, where my husband and wife. Um, when we all get together, it's like playing in a treehouse, playing imaginative games. And so the, uh, the books are really a kind of fantastic but kind of true record of what it's like to write a book. So how long would you say it takes you to write one treehouse story book? It takes one year because uh, there's a lot of thinking and a lot of planning goes into the the outline of the book and to even just coming up with 13 new levels takes longer each book because we've got so many things already. Uh, we have to, each level has to be completely new. In this book, for instance, we have a toilet paper factory because of the, uh, the shortages of toilet paper earlier in the year. Uh, we thought, well, this would be something that Andy and Terry could have fun with. Um, so there's one and we haven't had it before. So about if I had to break it down, three months of planning. Uh, Terry needs a couple of months to do rough artwork. Jill and I need another couple of months to then lay out all the book. And then we take another four or five months to rewrite the book many times until it's just a beautiful, fast moving flow of funny action. So what is your favorite part of the process of writing a book? I think it's that initial planning where, where you're just coming up with our ideas, random ideas, silly ideas, some good ideas, you don't know, you just generate lots of ideas. Um, that's fun because there's no responsibility at that point. Once you've made your decisions on which 13 levels you're going to do and what's going to happen, then you have to start um, thinking a little bit harder to make sure each action and each event leads to the next event and how that would, how the characters would act. So that's a little bit harder but the freedom of a blank page is really the bit I love the best. So did you, have you like ever gotten writer's block? And if so, what do you do when it happens? I don't have writer's block, I have the opposite. I have writer's, um, can I say diarrhea? A um, lot, of, lot of ideas are always there and it's, it's picking, making decisions about the right ones. Um, if I ever need to, if I'm having trouble, all I do is make a list. I would make, the, I'd write the word, the numbers one to 10 in a row, and I could write 10 things that might happen in the treehouse. And then I challenge myself to come up as fast as I can with 10 ideas. And I know that one or two of those will be really good and I'll recognize that and I'll suddenly get excited and then I'll be wanting to develop that idea and writer's block or any difficulty knowing what I want to write about is gone because really I'm already solving problems and, and, on, and creating story. So have you like always wanted to be an author? I've always written, uh, even from a very young age, from say the age of six, I was making little greeting cards, funny ones. Um, I was drawing cartoons. I had a little uh, exercise book and I'd cut things out of magazines and newspapers and paste them in and write things about them. I'd, I'd copy out passages of my favorite books, where they Enid Blyton books and uh, Dr. Seuss books. And also when I was in year seven, I was probably about 12, I made a little magazine for my classmates and um, I would put out issues where I'd get jokes and cartoons um, and write stories and sell that to people in my class and, and outside of my class for three cents a copy. So. I've always written. Uh, it wasn't till I became an English teacher when I was say 27, 28, and I met a whole lot of kids who didn't like reading and hated writing. And I started writing funny things for them. And they began to get the idea, hey, writing and reading is actually 
kind of fun and it can be silly and you can think up things you never thought. And so that's how I started writing a little more seriously, even though I was writing non-serious stuff. I started to think, oh, I'd really like to see if I can write some stories and maybe publish a book. So what advice do you say would you have for any young people who hope to be like you when they're older? Um, <laughs> hope to be like me or hope to be writers like me. Right. Subtle difference. Um, I've just given you quite a few of my hints there. I, I would get that exercise book, a little journal. Uh, don't call it a journal, I just called it an ideas book where I would some, I'd paste something in each day, write something down that someone said, something silly that your mother or father did, write it in the book. Um, but just get some writing practice in each day. It's very important. And the more you write, the better you'll get at writing. It's like anything else. So practice daily and also read as much as you can. Like read a book a week, read, um, get to fill your head with lots of ideas and see how other writers have done it. And a lot of my books, including The Treehouse, are based on books that I loved as a child. So in an Enid Blyton book called The Folk of the Faraway Tree. It was a tree that had people living in it, funny people, and, the, and these kids would have adventures. And at the top of the tree, there were amazing lands. So you can see I've taken some of those ideas and made them my own. Um, so reading, really important. The journal is important. And keeping your eyes open as you go through your life will give you all the material that you need. You need to take notice of what's going on around you, be interested in what's happening, and, um, and that all comes together when you start writing your stories. So how can your fans follow your social life? I have a Twitter account at Andy G Books, and I have Instagram at um, Andy G Books, the same one, the, the, the at and um, also on the website andygriffiths.com.au uh, there's a lot of information a lot of videos and we also have a gallery of readers art when people send us uh, particularly good or funny pictures of of tree houses and people in the tree uh, we put those up on the readers gallery so lots of ways to connect there so Christmas is coming close. So have you ever thought of writing a Christmas related book? <laughs> uh, I have actually, I've, I've got an idea where Andy and Terry have set a trap for Santa Claus. They're trying to catch Santa Claus in the chimney um, so that they can force him to give them lots of presents. And so I've got that idea that could be used in a future Treehouse book or it might be if the Treehouse series ever ends, we might bring out a Christmas book. But um, I am aware that not everyone celebrates Christmas too. So that's a, that's a consideration there, that, um, holding it back, I guess. So how do you usually spend Christmas? Do you have like any family traditions that you do? Yeah, I come from a, a pretty big extended family and every Christmas for my entire life, we've all gotten together, three or four families, a big tribe of cousins and aunties and uncles. And we just have a day of eating and laughing uh, because in our whole family, there's a kind of offbeat sense of humour. Um, the type of humour that I find funny and have put in all the books. Um, my cousin David, for instance, is very, very funny. Um, fortunately, he's not a writer, so he's no competition to me, but uh, we just have a lot of fun and um, it's one of my favourite days of the year. And interestingly, so is the day when a book is published, when a new book comes out. That to me feels very similar to Christmas morning. Uh, it's like this magical thing 
that 12 months ago you, it was only an idea and because of a lot of hard work and a lot of luck and um, um, you know with a lot of sweat uh, suddenly you're holding this this magical thing in your hand that that is like Christmas morning so I get two Christmases I'm very lucky <laughs> So lastly, can you tell us a completely random fact about yourself? Oh, completely random fact. Uh, I like collecting things and this links back to what can people do to be a writer. A writer is really someone who collects ideas and observations and, you know, mu music. I love you can see a very big music collection behind me. but. That collecting can turn anywhere. And if I look around, uh, his, I've been collecting eyeballs recently. Um, that's a jar of eyeballs, <laughs> handily, helpfully labeled eyeballs. So <laughs> there's a random fact about me. I like to put random things in jars and write labels on them. And then if I ever need a spare eyeball, um, you know, if you, accidentally scoop it out with a teaspoon or something. It's a simple matter of taking the eyeball, putting it back in, and <laughs> it's, it's, but yeah, I'm a bad collector. I'll collect anything, things on the ground. Anything. Okay, so thank you so much. And I can't wait to keep reading your amazing books. Thank you very much, Roxy, and good luck with your magazine editing. I'm very envious that you have a real magazine. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed interviewing the amazing Andy Griffiths. He was so amazing and gave so many great tips. So I hope you get something out of this. And also, maybe one day you can become an amazing writer just like him. Also, make sure to pick up your copy of the 130 story treehouse it is i reckon the best one yet it is so good and i hope you guys enjoy it bye guys